The Devil All the Time, directed by Antonio Campos, features Robert Pattinson in his scariest role since Twilight. But Edward Cullen and Pennywise jokes aside, The Devil All the Time is a slow, brooding drama with interconnected stories that span decades. It also reminded me never to go hitchhiking. In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into the film, explaining how everything's connected as well as the film's hidden meaning. But before we get into it, take a moment to make sure you've liked and subscribed so you can be notified as soon as one of my videos drops. The first thing you'll notice is the film's narration, voiced by Donald Ray Pollock, who is the actual author of the book the film is based on. He was raised in the real city of Knockhamstiff, Ohio, one of the two main locations the film takes place in, the other being Cole Creek in West Virginia. The book The Devil of the Time has been described as hillbilly gothic, and it's no wonder considering the author refers to the townsfolk as being related, if not by blood, then by quote, one godforsaken calamity to another. It's here we we meet Willard Russell, a man his son Arvin says, quote, fought the devil all the time. But was it the devil he was really fighting? Throughout the film, the devil is hardly mentioned. I counted only twice where the name is said outright, once in the narration and once by the preacher Preston Teagarden. Oh, we'll get to him. On the other hand, God, the Lord, the Almighty are mentioned in almost every scene. The decisions made by these characters aren't so much based on a fear of the devil, but by a fear of God. And Willard's cautionary tale is one of these examples. He goes off to war and swears off praying after seeing the atrocities committed by man. One event in particular where he kills a marine who was left to die hung on a cross, foreshadowing the deaths of all those who believe. In fact, almost every fervent believer in this story dies aside from Emma, but let's be real, her being embarrassed in front of the church for making chicken livers was punishment enough. I've never been so embarrassed in all my life. Upon returning from the war, Willard meets Charlotte. It's at this diner where Carl Carl and Sandy also first meet, the two serial killers who take photos of their victims. You have one waitress who is good, she even gives a homeless man some food when he's chased out of the store, and one waitress who will end up murdering dozens of young men. This dichotomy between good and evil is projected through the characters, with Arvin and his father being the only main characters who walk the line between the two, often doing bad things for good reasons. Willard gives his uncle a German Luger and jokes about how it was the one Hitler used to kill himself. I since this same gun will kill one of the film's most evil characters. Willard is one of a few characters who actually has a character arc and changes because of it. He turns from non-believer to believer, but this change ends in tragedy. The first act of the film is warning us of the dangers of belief, or perhaps the dangers of belief taken too far. This is shown through many of the characters, but perhaps none so much as Roy Lafferty, a preacher who locks himself in the darkness after getting stung by a spider and fears he's lost lost his connection with God. God tells him to take his wife Helen into the forest where Roy will be used as an instrument to resurrect her. Of course this goes as well as you'd think it does. Helen is killed and remains dead, something Roy says must be God testing him. Earlier in the film we overhear how Roy's brother Theodore lost his ability to walk after drinking antifreeze in another apparent test from God. If Roy was willing to kill his wife for the Lord, was he also the one who made and or convinced his brother to drink drink that antifreeze. Roy's escape is short-lived when he's picked up by Carl and Sandy. This is one of their first kills, as we'll see how sloppy Carl is here. This is juxtaposed later in the film when Carl and Sandy have their whole operation down to a science. They stop in a secluded area under the pretense of lunch, offer the victim some booze, and start slowly with innocent pictures. The funny thing about Roy is, even though he just killed his wife, he still considers himself a good man, refusing to fornicate with Sandy and ready to die rather rather than do the deed. He is blinded by faith, a faith that has led him to his own demise. Fast forward to 1965, and Arvin is now an adult, he fights off a group of bullies picking on his stepsister Lenora. As a child, Arvin was also picked on, and it was his father who taught him to fight back. Lenora and Arvin couldn't be further than one another when it comes to faith. When Arvin tells her the world is filled with no good sons of bitches, the same line he was taught by his father, she says, well, Maybe you should try praying for him then, would that hurt now? You already do enough for all of us. Where is it doing you much good, huh? Arvin saw how faith poisoned his father, resulting in his father sacrificing their dog, believing it would save Charlotte from cancer, and later he ends up taking his own life. Sacrifice plays a large role throughout the film. God had a tendency of asking man to make sacrifices. 
in order to prove their faith. Not only does Willard sacrifice his dog, but Roy sacrifices his wife. And Preston gives up the good meat, saying, As a new preacher of this church, sacrifice myself so that y'all can have a share of the good meat tonight. Lenora even tells Arvin that if her father, Roy, who killed her mother, were to somehow reappear, she'd forgive him, something Arvin thinks is crazy. I've already forgiven him. I could start over. That's crazy. This idea of forgiveness is something that Arvin grapples with, ultimately forgiving his own father for killing himself when he realizes his father had no choice. And Arvin even thinks he himself may one day be forgiven for what he's done. He started to think maybe the law would recognize he'd done good. Maybe he'd be forgiven. Lenora ends up falling for the new preacher Preston Teagarden, a grifting pastor who owns a flashy car, cheats on his wife, and uses his power of authority to rape young women. When Lenora tells him she's pregnant with his child, he gaslights her, says it's not his, that it never even happened at all, and if she does have a child, she should get rid of it. Lenora hangs herself, but at the last minute decides not to go through with it, but she slips in what some may call an act of God and dies. These mysterious acts of God are littered through throughout the film and are easy to miss. Willard one day just feels inspired to start praying again. The narrator says a quote, invisible force pulls Arvin back to knock him stiff, and his car just happens to break down, leading him to be picked up by Carl and Sandy. It's as if some omniscient puppeteer is putting all the pieces of the puzzle in their place. Arvin watches Preston engage in his nefarious acts and confronts him at church. He's learned the best time to engage his enemies, a lesson he learned from his father. Now you remember what I told you. Just gotta pick the right time. He's going to kill Preston, but not before Preston goes off talking about how Lenora was delusional. She was delusional. This is a throwback to a sermon he preached about how delusions lead us to sin. It is our delusions that lead us to sin. But as the film ends, we learn delusions don't lead us to sin, they lead us somewhere unexpected, perhaps even to hope. Arvin dreams of a life with a girl and kid, not sure if he's going backwards and forwards. As the narrator says, it's a place where there is no fighting or screaming or pain. That doesn't sound like sin to me. The last act of the movie centers around Clay and Sandy. After 14 road trips culminating in multiple kills, Sandy wants out. She even calls the cop after one of their kills to tell them where the body is. Carl will never stop. As the narrator says, his kills bring him closer to God. Only in the presence of death could he feel the presence of something like God. This is what makes the ending all the more tragic. Sandy was looking for a way out, even thinking of murdering Carl if she had to. The thought of killing Carl and taking off with the boy in the back seat suddenly crossed Sandy's mind. He was young, but that didn't mean she couldn't make it work. Yet another example of a delusion, one that also gives her hope. But this hope is short-lived when she is shot by Arvin after firing a blank. She didn't realize her paranoid husband had replaced all the bullets with blanks, who said God didn't have a sense of humor. Sandy's death is reported to Sheriff Lee Bodeker, who happens to be her brother. He's a crooked cop receiving money from a brothel owner named Leroy. For those with a keen eye, the front of the bar where the brothel is found is where Willard goes for a drink after the death of his wife. And guess who happens to to work there, Sandy. Lee allows the brothel to run in exchange for Leroy lining his pocket, but with an election coming up and the townsfolk wary of his crooked ways, he wants to distance himself. So he ends up killing Leroy and his bodyguard Bobo, with a British pistol Bobo said whose bullets can't be traced. Not only that, but Lee covers up his sister's serial killer past, knowing that if it were found out he had a serial killer prostitute sister, it probably wouldn't be great for his re-election. Lee tracks down Arvin in the forest, near where he picked him up eight years earlier than night his father died. Nine millimeter Luger bullets were found at Sandy and Carl's crime scene as well as Preston Teagarden, so he's pretty sure Arvin is the one responsible for his sister's death. Arvin ends up killing Lee, he has no choice, it's either kill or be killed. He also had no choice when he shot and killed Carl and Sandy, and even after Preston's death he said he had no choice in that either. He hurt my sister so bad, she killed herself, Sheriff, I had no choice. 
Once again, it's as if something is guiding him and the other characters. Is it God or is it the devil? Arvin also kills Lee with a Luger at point blank range while Lee is armed with a shotgun. It's kind of ironic since earlier Uncle Erskill said this when giving him that very Luger. Shotguns will do you good. Maybe the film is trying to say something about beating the odds, but I'll get to that in a bit. As Lee dies, he looks up to the sky and we get almost the same image that Roy saw moments before his death. Roy looked up at the clouds drifting by and wondered if that's what death would be like. Just floating away in the air. Arvin ends up finally being able to bury his dog, a symbolic act of closure for him and to the story. He ends up hitchhiking, which you'd think he'd learn his lesson, but I want to talk for a moment about the last line of the film. Right now, he needed to sleep. I just felt lucky. Someone was giving him a ride. While the film deals with some pretty grim themes, there's one that's riddled throughout that's easy to miss. That's kindness. It all started back when Charlotte sneaks to the back of the diner to give a homeless man some food, telling Willard, Some people just need a little help once in a while. You know what I mean. Arvin remembers the kindness the man at the general store showed him the night his father died. You were awful kind of me, and I just want you to know that I never forgot it. All these moments had nothing to do with God, and maybe that's the point. While the preachers and believers in the story ramble on about God, it's these small acts of kindness that I find to be much more profound. And as Arvin drifts off to sleep, the radio plays a clip of President Johnson saying America must continue to defeat the enemy. But Arvin is off to sleep, dreaming of a different world where there is no more pain or suffering. Perhaps he has finally let go of his violent philosophy, one handed down to him by his father and that will no longer hold power over him. Arvin has defeated the odds just like he did with that Luger and broken out of this violent cycle. Thanks for watching everyone, please make sure to like and subscribe and for more bad takes follow me on Instagram and Twitter at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember, daddy loves you very much.